Good morning, Grace. Uh, we are going to be finishing up Matthew chapter 5 today uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I hope that you've been able to be with us this far uh, going through the Sermon on the Mount. Um, uh, I would encourage you to go back. Uh, if you haven't listened to the ones previous uh, to this, uh, go back uh, because uh, Jason and Jay's messages are, are extremely helpful. Um, and putting all of this together uh, in order is a really helpful thing for us and not forgetting what has come before. Um, Jesus is closing out a, a section, uh, a way of speaking that he has been doing for the last several days. Um, and so it would be really helpful if you have all of those things together, um, and, and including the previous statements that Jesus has made. So if you've missed a day, please go back and, uh, and watch it. Um, it's really important that we understand all of this together. So uh, let's pray. Let's ask God uh, to give us understanding, to be with us, to guide our understanding, to guide our hearts, um, and to help us to apply it in a way that will bring glory and honor to him, and in a way that will make us, as followers of Jesus, more like uh, our master, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. God, thank you that you have given gifts and abilities uh, to teachers, uh, to instruct. Um, God, I know that I am so grateful for the teachers that you have put in my life, uh, and I hope to be able to be helpful to others. God, but I have so, you know, we have so much uh, sin in our lives. We have so many messed up things in our lives uh, that, uh, that even as believers, we require you to work through us. Uh, in order to produce right understanding, uh, right teaching um, of your word. And so God, um, you know, we study and we pray and we desire that you would uh, teach us, that you would help us to rightly comprehend your word, um, that we would rightly comprehend it and that we would rightly obey it uh, with, with right hearts, that is hearts that are motivated for your glory um, and not for, for our own gain or for our own um, reputation or anything like that. Uh, God, would you help us to please uh, set ourselves aside and learn from you? In Jesus' name, amen. Um, one of the important things about this particular section uh, that we have been looking at that really started, um, I'm going to say this particular section, this particular way of, of speaking started in verse 21. Uh, Jesus has this, we have this series of, you have heard, um, and you have heard that it was said. And in some of these instances, um, Jesus is addressing a, uh, or in all these instances, really, Jesus is dealing with false teaching or false assumptions or false applications of the law. Um, so with, with murder, he's like, yeah, it's, you're not supposed to murder, but it's more than that. It goes deeper. Um, you're not supposed to commit adultery, but there's stuff that's underlying uh, adultery that you need to deal with, uh, like lust. Um, hey, look, you think you're permitted to divorce because Moses mentioned this certificate of divorce, but you guys are taking this all out of the wrong way. God doesn't want you to divorce. God is a God of reconciliation. God is a covenant God. So you see, what Jesus has been dealing with is false uh, teaching. Uh, now, some of that false teaching, as I said, it, it, it's um, uh, they're getting the basis of that false teaching from the Old Testament, but the, the Old Testament doesn't actually contain it. Uh, and, and, and this is probably one of the bigger examples of that, because he says uh, in verse 43, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, the Old Testament certainly does, in many places, tell us to love uh, our neighbor, and told the Jews to love their neighbor, told the people of Israel, love your neighbor. But it never ever says, hate your enemy. And so people have falsely uh, accused Jesus here of saying that the Old Testament says that. They falsely accused him of contradicting the scripture, but, he, but he's not. He says, you have heard that it was said. And so it's really important that we really pay attention as we read the Bible and don't make assumptions. Um, Kind of like when, when Jesus says there's only one who is good uh, to the one who calls him good teacher. And 
and and people wrongly assume that Jesus says I'm not him you know when they say when he says there's only one who is good uh, so we don't want to make false assumptions he says you have heard that it was said love your neighbor and hate your enemy but I tell you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your father in heaven he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So there's a lot to deal with, but we're going to try to go through it in order and try to hit the main points. So the first one is, uh, Jesus is correcting false teaching. Um, and false teaching has, exists today, it existed in Jesus' day, and has existed ever since God started teaching people. Other people would take that t teaching and twist it to their advantage. Not that they would actually change the written word, but they would uh, explain it wrongly, and they would apply it wrongly and teach others to do the same thing. So we have to be so careful to return to the word of God and to read it carefully. Um, Young believers, I would caution you. Old believers, I would caution you. Read the word carefully. Don't accept the explanations of other people without considering what the word says. Read it carefully. Because Jesus here is not saying that the Old Testament said, uh, you know, hate your enemy. Uh, apparently, there were other teachers at that time who had interpreted scripture to mean that it was uh, that uh, that it was okay to hate your enemy but it doesn't actually say that anywhere in the Old Testament so be careful um, here uh, you've heard it was said love your enemy hate your uh, I'm sorry love your neighbor hate your enemy but I tell you love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you uh, now we have seen where God has told us in the Old Testament specifically uh, to love our our enemies uh, one particular place, which I'll, I'll go to now, uh, I'm just to remind you, because uh, not too long ago when we were going through the Proverbs, we read this in Proverbs 25, verse 21. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. Um, and uh, I was reading uh, from Second Kings, I think chapter 6, the other day, uh, where Elisha uh, takes captive the soldiers uh, that were sent from Ar Aram, I believe, um, and he, uh, he prays that the Lord would blind them, and he takes them captive, and they take him into, um, oh goodness, I think it's Samaria, but anyway, they take him to the king at, at, at the time, and the king's like, uh, my father, should I kill them? And he says, no, give him something to eat, give him something to drink, and send him home to their master. So we see uh, that men of God in the past rightly applied loving uh, their enemies. And so we're definitely supposed to love our enemies. Now Jesus ties this um, sort of back to what he had said in the beginning, what he mentioned in the beginning parts of, uh, of the Beatitudes, uh, where he said, um, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Now the specific part that I'm dealing with is this idea of being called a son of God. Now um, Jesus is the perfect son of God. But he says that in some way we can be called sons of God. Now, what does he mean by that, right? That's, uh, I think that that's something that I would encourage you to go to John chapter 8. I'll give you the highlight right now. But I would encourage you to go to John chapter 8, where Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. And he refers to them as being sons of the devil. Why? Because they do the works of the devil, like lies and murder, I believe he highlights in that chapter. So disobedience to God um, by lying and murdering uh, is showing that you are a son of your father, the devil. So to be a son in this sense is to do the works that the one has commanded. Uh, in a greater sense, Paul helps us understand how we're either slaves to sin or we're slaves to righteousness. And the way you know if you're a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness is by the works that you're engaged in. Paul's like, hey, if, if you're doing, uh, you're, the works you're doing show the master that, you're, um, that you are pledged to or that you are loyal to. 
So here Jesus, in this sense of being uh, called sons of the Father, he says you need to do things like your Father in heaven does them. And how does our Father in heaven do them? Well, right here in the passage he says that he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So God, in his uh, uh, what we call um, common grace, God provides good things, sustenance, uh, and, and blessing, and, and really things that bring joy, even on the evil, even on the unrighteous, even on those uh, who don't obey him, even on those who have declared themselves enemies of God uh, in their disobedience and in their rebellion against him. So he says, your love needs to be like God's love if you're going to be truly sons of your Father who is in heaven. Uh, and that's really where the rubber is going to meet the road. That's where we're going to have to apply uh, what Jesus is teaching. And I want to make sure we understand the rest. Uh, this are you not are not even the tax collectors doing that? Jesus, you uh, when he says, "If you love those who love you, what reward will you get?" The thing is, everybody um, sometimes, at least, treats the ones who they love and treat them kindly with kindness. Uh, yes, there are times we blow up at at others. Um, even in our family, there are times when we lose our temper, there are times when we are unkind or thoughtless or selfish, but for the most part, those who treat us with kindness, we treat with kindness. Even the unbelievers do that. Even some of the worst examples of, of uh, criminals in, in, in the world, even some of the worst dictators and tyrants uh, and evil people, um, Herod probably wouldn't be in this list, were kind to those in their family and those who loved them and those who treated them well. Um, so what he says is here he uses the, the, the worst example in their society, tax collectors, right? They were looked at as, as, as betrayers of the people, as enemies of God, uh, as the worst of the worst, as the most um, uh, unclean of society. They may have even had a lower position than Gentiles. I'm not really sure. But they were very, very much hated in the society. And he says, even these people who you view as horribly, horribly sinful love those who love them. So how are you any better than they are if that's how you live? If that's how you love others, you're no better than a tax collector. Um, it's pretty strong, uh, pretty strong language. Uh, and we should view it as such. Um... I would encourage you here to just think, what do you think? Because uh, I think we all, have these, um, we all have these opinions about who is the worst of the worst. And we've all looked at people and said, yeah, that person's beyond saving. And we know it's not true according to the Bible, but sometimes we still make those assumptions. And so whoever you're making those assumptions about, you need to think and take, uh, take, take seriously what Jesus says here. You're no better than they are. Because even they don't love those who love them. And treat those with kindness who treat them with kindness. But you're called to have your love be like God's love. So, uh, he says again in verse 47, If you greet only those who greet you, what more are you doing than others? Even pagans do that. Even unbelievers do that. Now he says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, here is one of the, one of the things that a lot of people uh, get tripped up over. Um, and I don't want to tell you that you shouldn't strive for perfection. The Bible definitely, definitely tells us that we should strive here. But Jesus is not saying that you can be perfect based on how you perfectly obey God's Word. Um, there is a false teaching that's called perfectionism, I think, um, and it teaches that this kind of thing is possible that you can actually stop sinning in this life. Or at least uh, some would say that you can stop sinning um, intentionally. You know, uh, I would say that that is a bad teaching. And I'll tell you why. Because Jesus has already told us that he has come to fill, fulfill the law. Well, the implication there is that nobody has yet. The law has not been perfectly fulfilled in human flesh up until Jesus came on the scene. 
Somebody has to be perfect in human flesh. Somebody has to earn perfect righteousness. Somebody has to totally fulfill the law, not just to the letter, but understanding the intentions. So Jesus has been taking away a lot of false teaching at this point. He's been wiping it out. He's been saying, no, that's not right. This is how you should understand it. No, that's not right either. This is how you should understand it. So Jesus is correcting the wrong teaching of the day. And also, when we read this, he's correcting uh, false assumptions that may or may not be in our minds, uh, that certainly exist in the world, that's certainly being taught. Um, but he's also saying, I'm the only one who does this right every single time. Remember, he said, you need a righteousness that's better than the righteousness of the Pharisees. So we take, Jesus says, I have come to fulfill the law. Uh, and he says, you need a better righteousness. And now he says, um, hey, uh, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Well, how do we do this? Um, this is uh, a situation where I, I, I'm really, really pleased that last Sunday, Alex read the book of Hebrews. Because there's a very, very helpful uh, chapter and a very, very helpful verse uh, that helps us to understand exactly what Jesus is talking about. So I'm going to go ahead and read from that chapter right now so that you can see what does it mean that we need to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. Um, uh, one big aspect of the teaching in Hebrews uh, is about the, the Jesus being our high priest and making a better sacrifice. And what that sacrifice accomplishes for us as well is specifically helpful in this question of how can we be perfect as our Father is perfect. And we already have, have established that only Jesus proved to be the Son of God perfectly as in always doing the works of God. Always. In that sense, and in others, Jesus is the, is the Son of God. But it, particularly in that sense, he's the only one who's ever obeyed God perfectly. So, let's go ahead and read what Jesus accomplished. Now, he's taught, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and start in chapter uh, 10, verse... I'm going to start in chapter 10, verse... Um, I'm just going to start in verse 1. I'm sorry, it's going to be a little bit long, but I just want you to understand this in the context, okay? So I'm going to start in verse 1. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices, repeatedly, uh, repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are annual reminders of sin, because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God." First, he said, sacrifices and offerings, uh, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second, and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus, has offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, when he died on the cross, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. This perfection that Jesus tells us we need can only be accomplished through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, through the atoning sacrifice of his death on the cross, through his blood shed there, uh, offered up as a perfect sacrifice, after having perfectly fulfilled the law, Jesus 
makes perfect forever. And it says here, has made perfect. In this sense, you can be perfect in as much as you have faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Trusting in his righteousness, trusting in his perfect life, his perfect sacrificial death, his resurrection, uh, and his ability to atone for your sin. You can be perfect in that sense. Um, and so uh, I, I want to uh, give you encouragement um, that you can be made perfect by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And if your faith is in Jesus Christ, you have been made perfect. Now that doesn't eliminate what Jesus says here because he still gives us a command. Um, I, I think that, that he says right here, he gives us a command, love your enemies. And, and out of that, I, whether you want to look at this as two separate commands or not, love your enemies, this is at least one way we can love our enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who persecute you. Um, Grace, I think that a lot of times uh, we, um, we're pretty good here about sharing the gospel. Uh, I wonder how good we are at praying for those who hate us, praying for those who persecute us. Um, this is something that we need to train ourselves to do. Now, I said earlier uh, in the reference to the... Um, to the uh, Jesus' use of the tax collector. I know, I mean, I'm just looking at my own heart. Maybe you guys are better than me. I really hope you are. Um, but there are sometimes people that get under our skin. Sometimes they're in the church, sometimes they're out of the church. Um, but there are people that get under our skin, uh, and there are people that, uh, outside of the church specifically, that we're like, man, I don't know if they're ever going to be saved. Um, and we say in kind of a defeated way, well, they're only going to be saved if God does something in their heart. I know we know the truth, but we just have these ways of talking to ourselves which are really wrong. Um, listen, how often do we pray for them? Uh, I am really trying, and I'm, I'm seeing the failure in my own life, I'm really trying to pray for people specifically um, that God would bless them. Uh, and not, uh, yes, in salvation, that's always going to be part of it, but also that God would bless them in, in other ways. God uh, says uh, here, um, Jesus says specifically here, that God causes his sun to shine on the, the righteous and the, uh, the unrighteous alike, and the rain uh, to, 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 fall on their, uh, to fall on them as well. And the, the idea here is allowing them to continue and have life giving them life, right? We have the sun and the rain. Uh, it's, it, their crops will grow. They will prosper. They will have life. They'll be a, have the ability to continue to live. Um, we need to love our enemies like that. We need to pray for those who persecute us. We need to pray for those we can't get along with. Uh, and so if we really want to be like our Father, if we really want to show that we belong to Christ, we need to be proactive about this in our lives. So I just want you to think, is there anybody in your life that you consider an enemy? Not in the sense that you're like, you know, uh, they're waiting around the corner to kill me or anything that, that, uh, like that, but somebody that you consider an enemy, somebody that you consider um, so sinful that you don't want to be around them, somebody that you consider uh, beyond God's grace, somebody, whatever the case, if you have that type of person in your life, uh, and from time to time we all do, pray for them. And I want you to pray also that God would show you a tangible way that you can love them and think about it, right? Um, because we're supposed to do this. We're supposed to, we know that love is an action, that love is not just a feeling. Uh, don't want you to just googly eye the person that you have something against, but I want you to do something about it. And I believe that's what Jesus is calling us here to do. Um, so think through that, pray about it, and, and go prove yourselves to be sons of your Father as in heaven. Let your love uh, be poured out indiscriminately on everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, so anyway, let's pray uh, and let's put this into, into practice today, Grace. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you have poured your love out on us, uh, that you have shown the ultimate 
uh, love for us in the, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray that that would always be on our, on our hearts to share the gospel with those who are dying apart from it, that we would love them in that way. But that would not be the limit of our love, that we would um, be friendly toward people, even if they are not friendly toward us, that we would be kind to people, even if they are not kind to us, that we would give if we have anything to give that would help the person to, to, um, to, to live, that we could just bless uh, people in some way. Whatever it is, God, that you would have us to do in order to show that we truly do love our enemies, um, I, I pray that you would help us to do that. I pray that you would help us to be more like Christ and put the things that he says here into practice. Um, that we wouldn't just know right teaching, but that we would put it into practice, that we would obey your word, uh, that we would um, purposefully love our enemies uh, and show ourselves properly to be your sons and your daughters. God, be with us today. We need your strength to do this. Thank you so much that you have made us perfect forever by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. God, help us to proclaim that message to, to everybody that we know. Use us for your glory today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Grace, read the word, understand the word, seek to understand it better, and go put it into practice for God's glory. Have a good day.